you know I'm from Cincinnati, you know I'm a, mid, a Midwestern optimist, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know about Kim, she's younger. I grew up under the glowing shadow of Robert A. Taft, and he was an optimist too. <laughs> I had, <laughs> he, I have a friend who I acquired over the years, the historian Lawrence Goodwin, who wrote the great book about American populism. And it's, yeah, if you want to read one book of American history, that's it. I, uh, but <laughs> Larry said to me once he was fuming, he's a southerner, he grew up in the tragic south and all that civil rights movement. And he said, you know, all the authentic radicals are from the Midwest. <laughs> he, he was sincere. He, he meant Debs at all, the beards and so on. He said, that's because you Midwesterners still believe all that crap about the goodness of America. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, that's true. We do. <laughs> we still think America can get there. A lot of other folks have given up, but Midwesterners know they're on the case, they'll keep going, and we've heard tonight, they got rid of the death penalty in Illinois, give me a break. Not yet, but you're, you know, you're, you're ready to close the deal, and the, and the, uh, and UE bless them, the country blesses them, the world blesses them, has the occupied a factory for when, the first time since? the 30s, 40s, whatever, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've written a, a lot over 25, 30 years about workers owning their own work in different ways. And I have this young friend, Naomi Klein, and her husband were down in Argentina helping the workers down there after their collapse and, and uh, to take over factories and so forth and so on. And I said, you know, I write these books that nobody reads about worker ownership and all this stuff, and you guys are down there on the barricades doing it, actually doing it. And he said, well, you're in a different context here, <laughs> and you have to understand the context you're in. And I think, I don't want to take all the energy out of this room because it's such a, it's such a marvelous evening. I do want to just announce that optimism is back. <laughs> you don't have to believe that, but I, but I, but I really feel that, and and I think it's, you know why I say that. The catastrophes are liberating the mind. If everything is really messed up, and in collapse, and all of the terrible things you thought were happening turn out to be true in places like Wall Street and Washington. You think, well, what the hell? I can dream a little bit, you know. And 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 I, I actually think that's where the country is not quite. This book, this last book I wrote, was basically, folks, let's talk real here. This is where we are, and this is what the, all of the causes. And uh, you got to start getting honest with ourselves because nobody in authority is going to tell us the truth. But here's here's what we're up against. It's going to be rough. It's going to go on quite a long time. And on the other side, we can emerge with a better country, a really better place, if, if you step up and do uh, the hard work of reimagining the future and then throwing your bodies into the fray and, and, and making it happen. I thought when I wrote the book this was a couple years ago, um, this would fit perfectly with the financial crisis since it was happening by the time the book was out. But it's still premature. I think it's I think it's fair to say most Americans, and I understand the the natural impulse, are not ready to quite get to that point of recognition. They still have a hope that the good times somehow or other are going to come back. And, and, uh, and the message I have is uh, that's not going to happen. It, it's not going to be tragedy. It's not going to be the desperation of 60 or 100 years ago. But, but those good times, as we knew them, are not coming back. So that's a hard message, I think. People will get there in the next couple of years, maybe sooner. 
And when they do, I, I believe, I hope, they will be this force that, that I'm imagining. The UE occupation will be a kind of icon at that point, and I think it will be in one form or another spread across this country. The sooner the better. Um, my the, the sort of wasteful abundance which we have most of us enjoyed for the last 50 years or more um, is over and that's not tragedy either but the question reasonably is asked well, well when that happens what replaces it my answer is um, larger lives. And I mean by that, it, it, I'm sorry, my answer is larger lives. That getting richer than the next guy or getting um, more stuff or getting more closet space, <laughs> whatever it is that gets, turns you on, that's going to be over. I, somebody asked me earlier, do I, I need to get that down to a bumper sticker? I actually have a bumper sticker, which I put in the book. It hasn't swept the country yet. <laughs> but you all can help in this. Larger, smaller cars for larger lives. That's the essence of it. And, and uh, I think it's true that we can do this. It's, it's technologically possible. It's politically impossible at this moment, but that can change. And um, when we do, we will find Americans at, at large, and here I'm jumping all across the boundaries of party and class and everything else, they will connect to, to the values at the heart of this. Uh, because they really are moral values as well as just basic social understandings of what makes decent sense. When this crisis broke, a lot of us thought, I mean most of us thought, gee, this feels like the New Deal again, the Depression, and, and we had our own ideas of the politics that would follow. I've thought about it now for a couple of years, and I, I've come to believe that the that this, this thing we're in is more like a hundred years ago and, this, and the populist progressive era uh, when labor struggles were taking off, socialist party, uh, civic reformers, etc. cetera. Uh, and that was also a really de decisive moment in which the terms of 20th century capitalism were established, uh, mostly not in, in, the, in the favor of the folks, the people. Some, some progress was made, but, 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 but the reforms that were laid down, like the creation of my secret temple, the Federal Reserve, were designed to keep the old order going and succeeded. We had in 1913 monopoly capitalism and the money trust, J.P. Morgan. Look, look around today. We've got the, the money trust is back and working in working Washington pretty well. There was severe inequality and uh, repression, powerlessness. Um, we're not in the same place today. This country is rich, rich, rich by comparison. On the other hand, uh, people are once again put in a, a sort of childlike, uh, frozen position where they, as long as they, they say the right things, they can exercise free speech. As long as they behave obediently, they can, uh, they can be taken into the hall. I mean, this, the political reality today is not as different once you dig under the surface, than, it, than in fact it was 100 years ago. Strangely enough, I find that hopeful <laughs> because two reasons. One, U.S. capitalism, separate from 
other kinds of capitalism around the world, but U.S. capitalism is at another critical point where it either has to change very dramatically or it will fall steadily apart. And that's an opportunity to go back to those origins a hundred years ago. And I think Tom has been inviting me every year for a couple of years to come out here. And I kept saying, yeah, yeah, try me again next year. And I just thought, boy, this is the year because this is 1910, hundred years back. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting is, and you all, I don't have to tell you, but you could, you could make this part of your, your shtick to go back to those voices, Debs, Gompers, um, Thomas, for sure, uh, Harrington, and say, what were these people really talking about? Because I think the, the, the brief twisted history that, that gets passed along in official circles is, well, there were a bunch of Reds arguing over ideology, weren't they? You know, what, did they, what was that about? Of course, we know that the, the, the core they were, they were moral prophets, saying things that the society was not yet ready to grasp. Although I think most Americans, probably even in that hour, said, "Yeah, that sounds right." And above all, they were um, they were advocates in a way that that was whatever their ideology was rooted in humanism. That's where we are today, I think. I think, I think, literally, that those messages, um, with a little bit of dusting up and revision, fit our situation today. We can't make the claim, which they made with uh, great clarity and force, that people, all people, or all working people, or, or large chunks of majority of the nation are in, in deprivation, ill health, et cetera, et cetera, um, because this is now a very wealthy country. And yes, capitalism production had something to do with that. But we all know that the, the capitalism was not going to deliver that higher standard of living unless the labor movement, socialists, doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh, reformers forced it upon them. Just you, you all know these words, I'm sure, but I just want to read them because I love them and throw them at people whenever I get a chance. Gompers, as you know, was not exactly the left end of the labor movement in those days. <laughs> and I take some risk at even bringing his name up. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was, he, he was ridiculed for many years by the, the, uh, capitalist press because he was asked, well, what does labor want? And the answer he was reported was more. And they ridiculed him and said, here's these greedy labor unions, what they want is more. Here's what he said, actually, 1893. Labor wants more schoolhouses and less jobs, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more constant work and less crime more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge. In fact, more of the opportunities to cultivate our better natures. That's what I mean by larger lives. And you know what? That's what people want. And, and, and it's not a secret that that's what people want. Uh, the question is, why, why is this not possible? And I'm I'm not going to go through, you all know this story. I don't need to tell it to you. You know it. You live it in different ways. I want to just say a few things mildly provocative and hope that they, they inspire you to go home and stew over this crackpot who said this or that. Yeah. But, uh, but, but to do your own thinking, because I think I literally believe that's what the country needs. And it doesn't need an organized format. It doesn't have formal meanings. It, it's literally people who care and have their heads on straight saying, wait a minute, if the whole order is collapsed and is now just being propped up, 
doesn't that suggest we need profound reordering of the way this system works, not to mention our political system, but really the economy? And the answer, of course, is yes. Now, here's, here's one of my provocations. The paradox that faces the left, and I'm using that in the broadest sense, liberals, labor, uh, left, whatever, how, whatever, whatever, progressives, whatever word you want to use. The dramatic events are pushing government and politics our way, leftward. And that's been going on now pretty, pretty dramatically for two years at least. In fact, it's almost inevitable when the, when the, when the corporate capitalism fails it's, or, or falters or is in trouble, government does step up. And that's, I mean, that's the story we're seeing play out right now. Uh, and we can sit around in the bar and chortle about the, the irony of that, or we could sober up and say, we're not even in the discussion. And, and, and left, again, left liberal labor, however you want to label us, um, I fear are not really ready for the discussion. And I say that with great sympathy because I've spent the last 30 years writing about all of the things you all talk about, deindustrialization and the, and the really the brutal suppression of labor, starting with the industrials and on down the line. I know that story well. And I understand defensiveness and, and uh, sort of war-weary hunkering down, but I really think I've said this to some unions and, and uh, meetings, and if labor doesn't do this and allies, who will? That's really literally where we are. Um, it's not our fault entirely that we're marginalized or out of the discussion, and, and me too, believe me, the more books I wrote the less parties I got invited to. <laughs> and actually, the truth is, when I, I was a big deal editor at the Washington Post, and I went to a lot of those parties, and basically you drink a little too much wine and you listen to some aging senator whine about how his children don't appreciate him. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth here. So I was glad to get back with the folks, and my idea of getting back to the folks was getting out of the Washington Post and working for Rolling Stone, and I did get back. I mean, I really did. But, so I know, I know the story, but um, I think our, our situation is, I, I don't want to make, I don't want to bring you down. This is a great evening. I love the spirit of it. But Barack Obama illustrates our predicament and his, I might add. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to bargain with labor or liberals or do-good or reform groups. Because he's a U.S. president, he has to bargain with corporate capital and the various sectors that lie across our country. If he bargains well and you know, stays within the yellow lines, those sectors will allow him to do certain good things. And I, I'm not knocking Barack Obama. He, this is the reality he was elected to. He has chosen uh, not, to, not to disturb those assumptions. And, and so we see it played out in health care. I mean, my guess is we all have pretty much the same take. That however we feel about the, the health care reform that passed, it doesn't get there and probably won't. And some years hence, we hope a few years hence, again, the economic forces will, will push the political system back to the table and they'll maybe get closer. Or maybe by then the country will be sufficiently pissed off that they won't be a choice, that they'll be, they'll be driving folks to the table. Um, the reason I bring it up, I mean, and I say this again with sympathy, they call Obama 
a socialist before he's got the sentence out of his mouth, right? And and uh, I was just telling a young friend, I said, you know, what if the president proposed a U.S. government system that delivered mail to everybody's house in this country? <laughs> Do you think he could get away with that? <laughs> and the kid kind of looked like, ooh, that's pretty <laughs> radical stuff. Anyway, given that, he's doing what he's doing. But this is very different from what our, our forebears and our, our wise men of 100 years ago uh, were up against. And this, I'm saying this is another provocation coming. In Eugene Debs' day, the government was weak, narrow purpose, confined by the Supreme Court and other forces, and it did not define the public interest or the common good in the way that the left sought. We don't have that excuse. In fact, we have a more complicated situation. The New Deal changed that and did set about to create, quote, big government, which became broadly positioned to do lots of things. And it did a lot of good things. It, it began to create common assets that everybody can use. It, 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 it established individual rights that that uh, that are we all can talk about how much that changed the country. It and the in successor governments created many critical, crucial protections for people, wh whether it's poison in the river or uh, or decent uh, behavior of police and uh, enforcing the law, etc. We could go on and on, and those are all real, and I'm and I celebrate them. But government also got big and flabby and uh, cozy with money and corrupted. And I think people on the left have a hard time facing that down. The rest of the country sees it. Um, and it's, it's hard to say, from our perspective, uh, Yes, that's terrible because we want to use the government. We want the government to use power in a way that Obama declines to do, but in a way we can imagine a, a, a strong president doing that really will put new rules on the table, et cetera, et cetera. Worse than that, the big technocratic government, the government of policy wonks and experts, and here I'm sensitive because Federal Reserve is the leading, shining example of this, has actually cut people out. It changed the language of politics, changed the language of government, cut a lot of representatives out, too. They can't understand what's being argued over. And, and what we have is a kind of two-tiered democracy. On the top deck are the, you know, the powerful interests, few, some elected officials, policy experts, economists, et cetera, et cetera, and everybody else is down on the second deck. Some of them are smart enough to understand what's being said, but most of us are not. That's what politics, that's what labor unions, that's what political parties are supposed to do for people. So I think there's a, a reconstruction here that is much deeper than debates over campaign money or debates over election laws. Again, I will note that that's, that's back in the day. That's what labor did 100 years ago, and socialists. So it's, it's not that it's hopeless, but that we have to take on that dilemma because people know this about the government. Now, it, it gets wildly cooked into uh, propaganda, distortions, etc. But there's enough truth in it that it's used by everybody in the system, and I'm talking moderates and even mildly liberal Democrats as well as Republicans. You can't do that because the people are against government. Well, you can selectively kill just about anything if, if, if that's your starting point. What is the democratic idea? 
it's not winning elections, it's not electing political parties, it's not blah, blah, blah. It's, it, the, the idea is that every person has the right to participate in the decision makings that affect their lives. It doesn't say you can win or lose, it doesn't say you will, anybody will agree with you even, but, but a real democracy would, would not only allow that to happen, it would, it would be embedded in the system so that it just happened in the due course of, of everyday life. And I think in labor terms, <laughs> this is also a very old idea. Um, go back to the Guild Socialists and, and others before Marx, making a very simple statement. Workers own their own work. Now, in a complex industrial society, that's it's a little harder to translate that with great big industrial corporations, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not beyond uh, doing. It's it's uh, there. There are a lot of ways to do that, and there, you know, as labor people know, there's a lot of arguments. Uh, I'm not going to try to choose sides. But I've I've ridden this hobby horse for some years, and I've actually first learned of it from the right side of the table. Louis Kelso was an investment banker, and he developed the employee stock ownership plans that create employee-owned companies in a, in a basically a financial way. And he believed, he was against the welfare state, he was a deep, deep Republican, but he believed capitalism would, would, could not fail unless the ownership of the, of the capital, the wealth, was broadly distributed and with some control over the outcomes. Then I got into Lynn Williams, the labor great steel workers president and others who were carrying this torch. And I know I'm well familiar with the controversies and difficulties in doing it. It's it's hard because ownership, whether it's an ESOP company or it's a it's a cooperative in the pure sense it requires people to change themselves. And you can't do that with a law or a snap of the fingers. It, it, it's a process. But I continue to believe that uh, it's, it's one, it's only one of several big paths we have before us. Now, I started to say, I've ridden this hobby horse and had conversations. One of the wonderful things about being a reporter if you have the uh, stomach for it, you can go just about anywhere in this society and knock on people's doors. And Americans are actually generous and open, wonderful people, most of them. A few of them are jerks, but I won't go in. But, but, they, but they, you go in and you have a conversation with them. And I come away just you know refreshed. My optimism is confirmed. And this idea, this idea that people ought to own their own work and they ought to have voice and some power, some influence within these organizations that they work in, people nod. It doesn't, you don't have to sell that for hours and hours. And they will raise questions of, well, how do, how do you know who's the boss and all of the, the complications. I've developed some simpler ways of explaining the idea because a lot of people, this is not a secret to you all. There are a lot of Americans, I would guess most Americans, who are never going to join a labor union for reasons we, we know. Not necessarily hostility, but whatever, that's the case. I would suggest that labor and socialists and others need to think about those people and try to, to, to talk about their lives and discover what is actually really overlapping. Because in my reporting, they're middle class professionals, they're middle managers, they're people who get on airplanes and fly around the world and so forth and so on. They have some of the same complaints and grievances. And this is going back over the last generation, many of the same doubts because I've interviewed them for the book on the global economy and other stuff. 
and they know the power of Wall Street to corrupt companies and crush them and turn them out in the street. They know the, the game that was going on before anybody in politics at the high level would, would acknowledge it in trade and globalization and so forth and so on. So there's, uh, this is really wishful, but I believe it. There is a majority waiting out there to, or at least a coalescence of people who think they are very different interests if, if people can discover how to translate those common values into their situations and to laboring people and to the poor and so forth and so on. This is really hard politics. Um, I actually believe in it and I, and, I, and I believe that the difficulty of it gets easier as the country sinks further into uh, the reality of fail, failing capitalism. We have ripe opportunities. Um, I could go on with principles, but he's going to hold up more cards, and then you all are going to run out and watch the hockey game, so I'll <laughs> cut it short. Well, uh, let, me, let me stop and, and make another big principle. We are, I keep saying this, but, but we, we have to we have to be acknowledge our reality. This is a very rich country, very rich, and we have a level of comfort and abundance and gigaws and good stuff. I'm a consumer, uh, unparalleled in most countries. We don't have health care. We don't have the, you know. We go down. You make your own list. We all know what the list is. So that right now we're in this totally fraudulent argument about deficits, and I just insert parenthetically, our president has made common cause with right-wing fiscal experts, and they are going after Social Security. Now, that's another speech. I won't go further, but I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a warning. But the, but the point I was going to attack is we can't afford this. We can afford this country anything that those other advanced economies can afford. Because with possible exception of Japan in its good years, our per capita income is like 50% higher than Germany's. It's more than that in France and so forth and so on. So th this is a pol political choice. Now back to my principle. The principle is uh, Anybody who is willing and able to work is, has a right to a job. That's a, another way of saying public employment. If the private, if, 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 the, if, the, if the private enterprise system will not create jobs for everyone, and we have a lot of evidence it won't, the government will create those jobs. Yes. And, it, and, and I could take another half hour to explain to you because I understand monetary policy and I understand economics. Once you've made that commitment, it sh it, it's like a tide through the whole economy and society. Not just for the people in the benighted neighborhoods and rural towns where they're never going to get jobs from the private economy, but for everybody else, it smooths things out. You're no longer playing this, this game of we dare not let un unemployment get too low because then we'll have inflation and then your bonds will lose interest, blah, blah, blah. That's all a, that's a game. The government, look, right now the system dumps the pain downhill. If, if, the, if the leaders think that we should slow down the economy, the pain literally goes to the bottom of the system. Poor people first and then up the ladder. Now we're in a crisis, and the pain is right up here in the middle. So you change that by saying, we're not going to put anyone on the streets because we have economic problems to fix. And the government, as a society's representative, will pick up the tab for that. Now guess how that's going to change the Federal Reserve's behavior? It's going to make it a lot harder for them to induce recessions. And it's going to make it more important to them to police the banks, et cetera, who, who are breaking things apart. Um, 
A job for everybody who wants to work is also another old idea. Franklin Roosevelt, as you probably remember or know from reading history, articulated this among his Bill of Rights in 1944. He didn't accomplish that before his death. A lot of what he laid out, actually, if you go back and go over the history, the federal government did accomplish, and then, and then much of it was also lost. What I'm saying is we, we can do a, not a rerun of history, not, the history doesn't work that way, but a, but a kind of sobering self-education in our time of stress and, and loss well, we're, okay, how far did we come, and, 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 and why? Maybe we were going after some of the wrong things and therefore didn't accomplish those more basic things which we, have, we, have the, we do have the ability to solve. Um, if our economy runs better in terms of output, efficiency, that is not waste, so would our society, so would our lives. This is so, this is, talk about straight out of Eugene Debs, this is so sort of elementary. Somebody undoubtedly would come along and call this socialism, and I would say, yeah, so what, you know, that's what I'll quit on. Thank you. Thank you.